don't care who likes it or not. As long as we know it's the truth. As long as we know it's the truth. A third city-state was officially created in 1982. That city-state is called the District of Columbia and is located on 10 square miles of land in the heart of Washington. The District of Columbia flies its own flag and has its own independent constitution. Although geographically separate, the city-states of London, the Vatican, and the District of Columbia are one interlocking empire called Empire of the City. The flag of Washington's District of Columbia has three red stars, one for each city-state in the three-city empire. This corporate empire of three city-states controls the world economically through London's inner city, militarily through the District of Columbia, and spiritually through the Vatican. The constitution for the District of Columbia operates under a tyrannical Roman law known as Lex Fori, which bears no resemblance to the U.S. Constitution. When Congress passed the Act of 1871, it created a separate corporate government for the District of Columbia. This treasonous act allowed the District of Columbia to operate as a corporation outside the original Constitution of the United States and outside of the best interests of American citizens. A sobering study of the signed treaties and charters between Britain and the United States exposes a shocking truth. 
The United States has always been, and still is, a British crown colony. King James I was famous not for just changing the Bible into the King James Version, but for signing the first Charter of Virginia in 1606. That charter granted America's British forefathers a license to settle and colonize America. The charter also guaranteed that future kings and queens of England would have sovereign authority over all the citizens and colonized land in America stolen from the Indians. After America declared its independence from Great Britain, the Treaty of 1783 was signed. That treaty specifically identifies the King of England as the Prince of the United States and contradicts the belief that America won the War of Independence. Although King George III of England gave up most of his claims over his American colonies, he kept his right to continue receiving payment for his business venture of colonizing America. If America had really won the War of Independence, they would never have agreed to pay debts and reparations to the King of England. When Congress passed the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, the U.S. President was made subservient to the King of England. The 13th Amendment is called the Title of Nobility Amendment and forbids U.S. Presidents and their officials from using royal titles like King or Prince or Baron. For some mysterious reason, the 13th Amendment, which was ratified in 1810, no longer appears on current copies of the Constitution. America's blood-soaked war of independence against the British bankrupted America and turned its citizens into permanent debt slaves of the king. In the War of 1812, the British torched and burned to the ground the White House and all U.S. government buildings and destroyed ratification records of the U.S. Constitution. One century later, a corrupt U.S. Congress committed the biggest theft in world history. They passed Paul Warburg's Federal Reserve Act in 1913 handing over America's gold and silver reserves and total control of America's economy to the Rothschild banksters. Most Americans still believe that the Fed or Federal Reserve is the government. It is not. The Fed is a privately owned banking system whose majority Class A shareholders are the Rothschilds, Warburgs, Kuhn and Loeb, J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller, Israel Seif, and the Lehman Brothers. This private banking cartel is the Fed and is never audited and never pays taxes. They print and design America's money, which displays their symbols of an Egyptian pyramid, a Masonic all-seeing eye, and the words, in God we trust. Who exactly is the God they trust? They also collect American taxpayers' money through the IRS. Then they loan it back again with interest to pay for roads, bridges, and other public works. American presidents are hand-picked and financed by these special interest power groups. Like George W. Bush, John Forbes Carey, whose initials are JFK, is a member of Yale University's Skull and Bones Brotherhood. The Forbes part of John Kerry's name identifies his descendancy from Captain Robert Bennett Forbes, who was a drug runner for the Rothschild's opium drug trade with China in the 1800s. Most U.S. citizens believe that the United States is a country and that the president is the most powerful man on earth. The United States is not a country. It is a corporation, and the president is president of the corporation of the United States. He and his elected officials work for the corporation, not for the American people. Since the United States is a corporation, who owns the corporation of the United States? Like Canada and Australia, whose leaders are prime ministers of the Queen and whose land is called Crown Land, the United States is just another Crown Colony. Crown Colonies are controlled by the empire of three city-states. At the center of each city-state is a towering, phallic-shaped stone monument called an obelisk that points skyward. In D.C. city-state, the obelisk, known as the Washington Monument, was dedicated to Freemason George Washington by the Freemason Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia. The point of this is, most of what we think we know, we don't know. And it's wrong. And I just want you to keep that in mind. And this is not a conspiracy theorist. This is not Jim Mars's quote. This is Woodrow Wilson, a very powerful insider an insider who was put into office 
by men connected to secret societies. He knew what was going on, and what did he write? Some of the biggest men in the United States are afraid of somebody. They're afraid of something. They know that there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that they'd better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. How much more do you want, folks? He's trying to tell us what's going on. So let's quickly, I'm going to quickly run you through the modern secret societies and how they connect. And I'm going to try to do this as rapidly as possible to get to the really good stuff. We'll start with the Trilateral Commission, which is one of the more recent ones. This was formed in uh, 1973 uh, by David Rockefeller and one of his henchmen, Zygmunt Brzezinski. Um, and it was obviously an outgrowth, an extension of the even older and more secretive Council on Foreign Relations because David Rockefeller and Brzezinski were both members. All seven original members of the Council on Foreign Relations were members of the, uh, I mean, uh, seven members of the Trilateral Commission were members of the Council on Foreign Relations. So it's safe to say that it was simply a little more open, a little more public, uh, extension of the Council on Foreign Relations. What it also did was, because of its name, Trilateral, which refers to the trilateral nations of uh, Japan at that time to include China now, North America and Europe, the trilateral nations. And uh, so not only was it an effort to uh, have a little bit more open, uh, less secretive organization, but to also to include the Asian economies. Uh, they put out various position papers, and I particularly like the one issued in 1975, Democracy in Crisis, where they basically said and argued that, you know, there's a little bit too much democracy in the United States, and it's just really not good for business, so uh, maybe we need to curtail that a little bit. Now, that was 1975, and I asked some of you older folks here about my age, do we have more or less democracy in the United States today? Seems like that uh, they're getting what they want. You, you might also notice, that I found it interesting, the, uh, the logo of the Trilateral Commission looks suspiciously like a stylized swastika. And that may not be my imagination, as you will soon see. Senator Barry Goldwater, in his book, With No Apologies, just flat stated that the Trilateral Commission is intended to be the vehicle for multinational consolidation of the commercial banking interest by seizing control of the political government of the United States. And in fact, that seems to be what exactly is going on right now is a merging of corporate uh, with federal government. Which brings us to George W. Bush. who I call a post turtle. Some of you say, what's a post turtle? Well, that's a term we have down in Texas. You're driving down a country road and you see a turtle perched up on top of a fence post. That's a post turtle. You know he didn't get there by himself. <laughs> you know somebody put him up to it. <laughs> And you know he can't do anything while he's up there. <laughs> and basically all you want to do is help the poor creature down. <laughs> Post turtle. If it wasn't so serious about what's going on, it really would be pretty laughable. So now that tracks back to the even more secretive Council on Foreign Relations. This was formed in 1921 by a group of people in, that were including... Uh, Colonel House, who was the right-hand man shadow to Woodrow Wilson, and their whole avowed purpose was to educate the American public on the desirability of global government. And why did they feel like they had to do that? Because they had already made their first attempt, the League of Nations, okay? But it didn't work. Why? Because the Senate of the United States said, I'm not sure we're ready to give up our national sovereignty. How many times have you heard the politicians in the last year talk about sovereignty? They don't talk about it, do they? 
For that matter, when's the last time you heard a national politician talk, refer to the republic? They don't talk about that much either, do they? And while we're here, let's stop and briefly, and I, uh, let's explain what I'm talking about here. Oh, all they talk about is democracy. Democracy. God saved democracy. We love democracy. The terrorists hate democracy. Well, what is democracy? Democracy is ruled by the majority. What's the primary example of democracy in action? A lynch mob. Okay? Everybody says lynch him, so they do. Folks, this is not what we were handed by our ancestors. This was never intended to be a pure democracy. What we are supposed to have in this country with its constitution, its bill of rights, is a, con is a democratic republic. Now, what's the difference? In a pure democracy, the lynch mob. Lynch him, okay? You string him up. In a democratic republic, you have to go through a system of laws, checks and balances, courtroom procedure. You have to give the guy a fair trial. There are certain procedures and laws that you have to follow. You have to, he has the right to meet his accuser. He has the right to defense. He has the right to cross-examine the evidence and the, and the uh, witnesses against him. And then if he's found guilty, then you can hang him. Okay? That's what we're supposed to have. And this is not what we have now, is it? Now they can grab you, lock you up, and uh, if they decide, if one man, John Ashcroft, who, who's up until 9-11's whole claim to fame was throwing covers over the bare breast of statues in Washington, D.C., because he was upset. No, oh, oh. Talk about a boob. I didn't say that. But on his word alone, you can be declared an enemy combatant in hell without trial and without legal representation. They are stripping the liberties that we are guaranteed in this country. And it really is amazing to me because if Osama bin Laden was indeed behind the 9-11 attacks and there's still been no real proof that he is, but if he was and if his goal was to destroy a democracy and to end our freedoms, he succeeded, hadn't he? But we know that some bearded guy over in a cave somewhere is not responsible for everything that's going on in the world today. Who's responsible are these people, who's responsible are these people who have been working at this for hundreds of years. Uh, what's interesting is, notice, oops, they just cut the graphic. Can we put the graphic back up real quick? If you'll notice, over here is the CFR logo with the rider on the horse and the Roman, uh, the uh, um, Latin inscription. And over here is a medallion of the ancient Knights Templars. Looks pretty close, doesn't it? Same deal. And the same objectives are going along. They consolidated all of this a long time ago with the formation of the CIA and with the National Security Act of 1947. The National Security Act of 1947 is really what began to sound the death knell for freedom and democracy in this country. It was signed on September the uh, 27th, I believe, of 1947. And uh, it's really interesting to see what happened there. Now, most of the uh, things with the National Security Act of 1947 we're all kind of familiar with. We know it separated the uh, Air Force from the Army as a separate branch of service. We know it created uh, the CIA. Uh, we know that it changed the words, uh, of the title of the old War Department to the Defense Department, which is a pretty slick public relations move because if you go back and look at that old war department, oh, who wants a war department? But under the old war department, we only fought three wars, Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II. Under the defense department, where we're only going to defend ourselves, yeah, we got Korea, Vietnam, Kosovo, you know, Panama, you know, Grenada, uh, Laos, Cambodia, you know, Colombia, you name it. I think we need to go back to the War Department. <laughs> we didn't have near as many wars. 
But within these secret societies now, and everybody that's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations or everybody that's a member of the Trilateral Commission, they are not all sinister conspirators who are trying to take over the world, okay? A lot of them are just wannabes, you know? They want to be there. They want to be taking over the world. Or actually, I would describe it this way. Remember when you were in grade school? And the thing you really wanted most out of life was to be able to sit at the table with the cool kids in the lunchroom. Boy, if I could just be with those cool kids, maybe I could get a date for Friday night, <laughs> you know? That's what you really wanted. Well, these are the people who are globbed on to these secret societies. Most of them are not on the inner core elite. They are just wannabes, and they like, their, they like to be next to the wealth and the power, okay? But within each of these societies, there is a handful of people that, like, and one is David Rockefeller. He's in all of them, okay? Henry Kissinger, you know. And there's certain ones who are at the inner core of all of these societies. They meet once a year uh, in a group known as the Bilderbergers. The Bilderbergers are so secretive that they don't even really have a name. They're called the Bilderbergers because they were first discovered by the public meeting at, uh, in um, um, Holland back in 1954. And they were founded by Prince Barnhard of the Netherlands, who had uh, previously been a Nazi SS officer. And by the way, any of you all have Texaco gas cards? You do realize that Texaco is now bought by Shell. And Shell is the... That's the royal family of Holland, the founders of the Bilderbergers. So the New World Order marches on. And of course, then we've got Skull and Bones. I think we all know that uh, Prescott Bush, the patriarch of the Bush family, and that uh, George Herbert Walker Bush and George W. Bush are all members of the Skull and Bones. Now, there are some who argue that the Skull and Bones is the secret society behind the secret societies and that they run everything. I'm not convinced of that. There are plenty of people who have been inducted into the Skull and Bones and who have elected not to follow through on all their contacts and have gone on to live very respectable and, and good lives, okay? The Skull and Bones, however, is a springboard. That's where they take young men, they find the ones that, with ability and more importantly those that are compliant and they groom them to become world leaders. And all you have to do is just go study about the skull and bones and you'll find that there is an inordinate number of people who go on to take top government positions. Again, if this was really a free country, you'd think that we'd have some people from, you know, Southern Cal, University of Texas, Oklahoma, somebody. You know, there's got to be some smart people around somewhere. But these folks are always the ones that end up in power. Also, it has been established that the skull and bones is actually the Order 322. It is the 322nd chapter of the Illuminati. This was published in the New York Times. Now we get to the question of how come you don't know all this, and that gets back to the control over the media. First, you have to understand, the media cannot control every, I mean, these people, these secret societies cannot control all the editors and all the reporters across the country. No, they control the media through the distribution of the information. Just in the past several months, there have been some massive anti-war demonstrations taking place in California, in Denver, in Washington. And most of you have heard little or nothing about them. And when you did hear about them, oh, 30,000 people, uh-uh, try 500,000. There have been massive demonstrations in England and in Germany, and you very rarely hear about that. This is because they control not the editors and publishers, but the distribution of the information. And how do they do that? I've listed two here, Time Warner and Disney. There's another couple that I could mention. Uh, Viacom is another one. Viventi is another one. Clear Channel is now buying up all of the radio stations in this country. Clear Channel bought up Premier Radio not long back, and now two of its leading voices, Whitley Strieber and Art Bell, are no longer with us. Okay? And who owns Clear Channel? Well, it's connected to the Carlisle Group. That's Henry Kissinger and the Bush family. Okay? 
So they are clamping down on the access to information. And never lose sight of the fact is I don't care how brilliant you are, if you make decisions based on faulty, erroneous, or incomplete information, you're not going to be making the right decision. At the top is a note that was written to James Tucker, who uh, used to write for the old Spotlight, now writes for the American Free Press, and he has tracked the Bilderbergers for years. And uh, this lady that was an ombudsman with the Washington Post sends him a note and says, well, if observations of the Bilderberg, the Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations, Aspen Institute, etc., hold true, there's much that is ponderous, but little that is newsworthy. How's that for a condescending, unthinking response? Let me put it this way. What do you think the news media's reaction would be if all of the owners of the National Football League franchises were to meet in a big hotel secretly with armed guards all around it, won't let the media in, won't let anybody in, they meet there for about a week, and then they all come out and say, sorry, I can't tell you what we talked about. Whew. Would they blow their lid or what? They'd be yelling price fixing, collusion, restraint of trade, you know, blah, blah, they'd raise hell. But you get the leaders of commerce and banking and industry, and they meet once a year, and they hide themselves off in some big, well-guarded resort, and they come out and say, we're not going to tell you what we talked about. It makes a mockery of freedom of the press. It makes a mockery of freedom, period. We have got to start understanding who's really calling the shots because until we understand what's really going on, how can we make any decisions or do anything about what's happening in our own country? I had to throw in this cartoon. It says, well, the CBS Viacom deal, look at what you get. Movies, MTV, radio, videos, Nickelodeon, news media, theme parks, billboards, showtime. Just about every kind of entertainment and advertising you could want. The guy says, well, what about the news? And he goes, this is the news. <laughs> this is the news. Think about it, folks. Not long back, I'm sitting at home, and I don't watch TV that much, but I happen to have it on. They said that we're going to interrupt for a news, news break. I'm going, okay, good. I'll get to the headline news. Got to get caught up. There were four stories that they put out over this two-minute news break or whatever it is, and all four of them were sports stories. So-and-so won the Masters, you know, so-and-so won some football game, some baseball game. Don't get me wrong. I love sports. But sports are sports. They are not news. You can get all excited about the big game, but then next week it's over with and who cares? And what does it really matter? It doesn't. And that's what's masquerading, though, as news. Now, these folks... It's already been said right here at this conference that these folks are really the big, brightest and the best, and they are more intelligent than we are. And it's only right and proper that they run everything because they only have our best interest at heart. Well, let's look back over just the past hundred years. They've given us two world wars, two depressions, one acknowledged and the one currently not. <laughs> and doesn't sound like they're operating in our best interest. Not at all. They give us the Persian Gulf War. That was Daddy Bush's war. Drew his line in the sand. Just happened to be north of the, the Harkin Energy holdings of, he, of his son, George W., who just by sheer coincidence, I'm sure, sold off the bulk of those holdings right before the invasion of Kuwait and made himself a, almost a cool million dollars by selling short on that. Think, you think daddy might have whispered in his ear? Oh, no, I wouldn't do that, would they? Of course they would. And then the whole thing ends, just as everything's closing in. Got too much to cover here. I could give you the whole story. When the American ambassador goes to Saddam Hussein, April Glassby, and she testified to this in front of Congress but didn't go anywhere, he says, uh, we're going to go back to our original boundaries, which means he's going to take back Kuwait, which was illegally taken and carved out of uh, Iraq in the first place by the British years ago so they could uh, get their hands on some of those southern Iraqi oil reserves. And uh, he asked the American ambassador, you know, what do, what do you all think about that? And her almost exact answer was, well, uh, I've been instructed to inform you that we consider that an Arab problem and we don't really have any thoughts on that. What does that sound like? Sounds like do what you want to do. 
And then the minute he sends his troops into Kuwait, oh, he's the new Hitler. All right? And the Saudis put up a $12 billion war chest hidden in a secret account in, in London for George Bush to use to prosecute the Persian Gulf War. It's a deal, folks. It's just a deal. They're all just deals. This whole thing right now, I'll tell you what I suspect. We all know this thing from about Iraq is about oil. But why do we need the oil? We got plenty of oil in the United States and we're not getting that much out of the Middle East anyway. And besides that, we now have our troops in Afghanistan, which means we now control the Caspian Sea oil reserves. Something that's been a big bone of contention for the last hundred years ever since the Nobel brothers went over there and started uh, uh, production in the Caspian Sea area. When Hitler sent his sixth army charging through the Ukraine, they weren't going to capture Stalingrad. They were trying to get to those Caspian Sea oil reserves, but they got stopped at Stalingrad. It's been a big bone of contention. Everybody wants to get a hold of Caspian Sea oil. Well, now we have it. And Britain now wants their share. They want the Iraqi oil. And it's really funny because we see Tony Blair uh, standing up, and he's pushing for war with Iraq just about as hard as uh, George Bush. And we think, oh, our wonderful British allies, boy, they're with us through thick and thin. I think once you study these secret societies and where they came from and who's really behind all this, it's the other way around. BP wants the oil, but they can't move British troops into Iraq because quite correctly that would be perceived as aggression. But the United States has already fought a war with Iraq, so we can go in and take it for them. Y'all just hide and watch. If we have a war and we have a regime change and we get gain control over Iraq, you hide and watch if British Petroleum doesn't get a big chunk of that. It's all about oil. We all know that. And the problem is we're all so fat and sassy. We, well, yeah, but I got to have gas for my car, man. I got to drive down to the 7-Eleven get a pack of cigarettes, you know. I mean, yeah, it's only a block away, but who wants to walk a block, you know. We are just really so, we just have no idea of uh, the misery in most of the world because we all have it so well. I mean, you know. So it's all about oil, and my big complaint there is, is we don't need the damn oil, okay? We don't need to be on a petroleum energy basis anyway. There's so much other things we could be doing. Uh, do you realize that with just some tweaking of the intake uh, jets in your carburetor, you could be running your car on hydrogen? And hydrogen does not cause any pollution. And hydrogen is the most plentiful substance on the planet. Think about it. This is a water planet. H2O, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. We could be burning hydrogen. We don't even need the damn oil. But no, we're going to go over there and kill a whole bunch of people and probably our own troops and look what's happening with the Gulf veterans right now. They're all coming down with all kinds of sicknesses, probably because of the contaminated vaccines they got. Also the depleted uranium shells that were lying everywhere, giving them a radiation dose that destroys their immunization system, not to mention the, the oily smoke and petrochemicals hanging in the air. And do you think that a new war with Iraq is going to be any better? Never mind the massive casualties that Iraq's going to suffer. Wait till our guys come back in another 20 years, and they'll be raising hell about their, their health problems. And uh, what's the government going to do about it? I'll tell you right now, not a damn thing. Let me tell you something. When I was in the Army, this just really gets my blood to boiling when I think about this. When I was in the Army back during Vietnam, we'd get sea rations, and in the sea rations, along with the little powdered milk and the, this and the other thing, was a little packet of cigarettes. You had five little cigarettes. We always thought that was cool, free cigarettes. And those who didn't smoke would swap them around to those who did, and they, it was almost a medium of exchange. And that practice goes way on back even through World War II. Where do you think all those guys in World War II got the smoking habits? Because the Army gave them free cigarettes. And now under the Clinton administration, when some of these guys who put their life on the line to fight for freedom and democracy in World War II, and they start coming down with emphysema and lung cancer, and they go to the VA under the Clinton administration, they ruled that that was a self-inflicted disease and that they would not treat the veterans. That's shameful, folks. That's shameful. You give your soldiers cigarettes, 
all through their career and then you won't treat them when they get a health related problem? Unconscionable. But that's what happens when you let these secret society creeps run your country. Going back past the Gulf War and now we get back to Vietnam and uh, Lyndon Johnson and his wise men, okay, he surrounded himself with about 12, 14 guys and they were every one of them counsel on foreign relations. In fact, Vietnam, the thing I never could quite figure out is why were we fighting 9,000 miles away from the shores of the United States? Well, let me tell you why. Because right after World War II, the Council on Foreign Relations published some papers that were saying we needed to gain control over the mineral resources of Southeast Asia, which at that time was called French Indochina. All right, but then in the spring of 1954, the French got defeated at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, and they withdrew from French Indochina. Within weeks, John Foster Dulles, a founder of the Council on Foreign Relations, and who was then Secretary of State to Dwight Eisenhower, goes to the Philippines and creates something called the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, CETO. And he later explained that he did that to give the American president the legal precedent for intervention in South, in Southeast Asia. That was the beginning of the whole thing. Now, is he acting on the best interests of the United States, or is he acting on the best interests of the Council on Foreign Relations that wanted control over those mineral resources? And of course, I don't have to tell you what happened. 58,000 American lives later, we finally slunk away with our tail between our legs, defeated by a bunch of guys in, in rubber sandals, thanks to the wise men. And in the middle of this, when our guys are dying in the jungles of Vietnam, Who's over in Russia but David Rockefeller meeting with Khrushchev? And, on the exist and uh, with the insistence of David Rockefeller and his other powerful friends of the Council on Foreign Relations, they encouraged Lyndon Johnson to increase loans to Russia at levels higher than we did in World War II when they were our allies against Hitler. Now, what does this mean? It means, folks, that while our sons and daughters and brothers and husbands were over there fighting for their lives in the jungles of Vietnam, we were told we had to do that because North Vietnam was a surrogate of China and Russia and that if we didn't stop them there, then it's the domino effect and they'd take over the Philippines and they'd take over Hawaii and they'd take over this country and we had to stop them right there. And that they were getting arms and ammunition from China and Russia and it was an anti-communist crusade. And to that extent, it was true. They were getting arms and ammunition and war materials from China and Russia. And Russia was getting loans from us. And they'd take our tax-supported money, and they'd build facilities like the Kama River Truck Factory, and they'd crank out war materials to ship to North Vietnam to use against our guys. Does that make any sense to anybody? But that's what goes on, folks, and it's still going on. And unless we start waking up, it's going to continue. If you stop and think about it, gunfire has pretty well decided every national election from 1964 to 1988. 64, Lyndon Johnson wins on the sympathy because of the JFK assassination. 68, Nixon wins after uh, uh, the... Uh, reaction to the Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy shootings. Then in 1972, uh, George Wallace looks like he's going to pull votes from Nixon and he's shot. 1976, Carter uh, uh, wins after there were assassination attempts on Gerald Ford. And then in 1980, Reagan is elected after an assassination attempt on Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter? You don't remember the assassination attempt on Jimmy Carter? Why, he had asked for national TV time in the late spring of 1979, and he was going to announce some sweeping changes in government, including curtailing the CIA. But then he goes to Los Angeles, and he's attacked by Raymond Lee Harvey and Oswaldo Ortiz. So Lee Harvey and Oswaldo were going to kill him in Los Angeles. There it is. You saw it in the Newsweek article, but you don't remember that, do you? Because it didn't get distributed in the news media. And right after that, he canceled his national TV talk, went to seclusion at Camp David, called in everybody up to and including Billy Graham and said, I've lost control of the government. And he was out and Reagan was in. And two months after Reagan 
was elected, he shot. And if that bullet had been that much closer, it had hit his heart, and we would have had George Bush eight years earlier. People don't think about that, do they? Oh, well, I'm just, I guess that's a conspiracy theory. Speaking of, you're going to love this one, the Reagan shooting. All network tapes, clearly, you can clearly hear the sound of seven shots. Bam, 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 bam. Hinckley had a six-shot revolver. How do you get seven shots out of a six-shot revolver? And where did it come from? Up there, circling red, the bullet that struck Reagan was at a downward trajectory. Go back and check the media. They, they accurately reported that. And Hinckley, though, was standing level with him over here in the crowd, back over here beyond that policeman. Up here is a sliding glass door with a human figure crouched behind that door. Was this the person who actually shot Reagan? We don't know because there's never any investigations because all that's just conspiracy theory. But of course, Reagan was shot and for months, the person who was really in charge was George Herbert Walker Bush. You're going back to Korea, you find out that Russian generals were running the Korean War on both sides. Does that make any sense? And yet the bulk of the Allied troops was our guys, United States military supported by our tax dollars. We're really being taken, folks. Go all the way back to World War II. Again, I, I noticed it was mentioned here at this conference that well, uh, everything would have been okay except Hitler was the bad guy, and, and he, he kind of screwed everything up. Well, let me tell you, folks, do your homework. Hitler didn't just suddenly appear. Hitler, number one, was a military intelligence agent who was assigned to infiltrate the Nazi party. And he went back to his superiors and said, well, there's a, went to this meeting, there's only about nine guys there, but you'd like them because they want to rebuild Germany and they hate the Jews and they want to they want to rearm and they want to repudiate the Versailles Treaty so his superior said ah that sounds pretty good here's some money go back and help out so they created Hitler and then as he began to gain more power who was behind him another secret society the Thule Gesellschaft or the Thule Society made up of some of the leading industrialists leading intellectuals in Germany at the time people and also people who had an intimate working knowledge of the occult all right so now we can see that all of these secret societies have been working along and it was the same thing back during World War I. Same people ran World War I. It's amazing, but, uh, but uh, at the time of the Russian Revolution, where was Lenin? He wasn't in Russia. He was in Switzerland. Where was uh, Leon Trotsky, the, the communist philo key philosopher? He wasn't in Russia. He was in New York City working for Wall Street capitalists. And they gave him money, and they gave him uh, all kinds of support to go into Russia and take over a popular uprising and change it into a communist government. Lenin was the same thing. We all know that he was put on a seal railroad car and traveled through wartime Germany that was at war with Russia and was sent on into Russia to take over the government and set up the communist system. And one of the people who helped facilitate that was a leading banker in Germany who also was very highly connected with German intelligence, and that was a fellow by the name of Max Warburg. Now, don't you find it passing strange that in World War I, Max Warburg, who was head of German intelligence and a big leading banker there in Germany, his brother, Paul Warburg, founded the Federal Reserve System in our country and at that time was head of the, of the financial end of World War I for the United States of America. Does nobody find that amazing? Here he is, Paul Warburg. And, and here's the house on Jekyll Island where the plans were laid to instill upon us the Federal Reserve System which is neither federal nor has any reserves, all right? 
It is a system of 12 banks. <laughs> it's a system of 12 banks that are in turn owned by other private banks. And in fact, most of the studies that have been done show that the majority of ownership in the banks that control the Federal Reserve are held by people who are not even Americans. Think about that one. I could get into money and the whole thing, but let's keep going. Here's the original Federal Reserve Board, and there's, my, there's old Paul. He headed up the original Federal Reserve Board. And here we see Woodrow Wilson and Colonel House and his wife. And this is where it begins to tie into the older secret societies because as I've pointed out, Trilateral Commission connects to the CFR. The Intercorps leadership is Bilderberger. The CFR was created right after World War I by Colonel House, Bernard Baruch, and others to try to sell us on the idea of globalization. And these folks, had been members of the old uh, Cecil Rhodes uh, secret society called the Round Tables. Here is a cartoon from 1911 showing Karl Marx shaking hands with uh, J.P. Morgan, George Perkins, Teddy Roosevelt, John Ryan of National City Bank, John D. Rockefeller, and Andrew Carnegie. They financed communism. They created it. Why? So they could play both ends against the middle. Think of Cold War, and now it's over with, and think of the billions of dollars that were squandered on that Cold War. Think of what this country could be today if we'd spent that money building schools and upgrading education, upgrading health facilities. No, 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 that was not going to make them money. So see, back in 1911, those old folks knew better about what was really going on than we do today. And this is just a little graphic showing the New World Order and how that it tracks on down. You can take a look at that. I do want to mention the Hegelian dialectic. That sounds pretty fancy, but basically all it is is just um, action response and then synthesis, synthesis, whatever you work out. You all do this all the time. You and your wife or husband decide you want to go to the movies. One of you says you want to go see movie A. The other one says, no, I don't want to see that. I want to see movie B. Okay, well the one who wants to see movie A, that's thesis. That's his thesis or her thesis. One says, I want to see movie B, that's antithesis or antithesis, the antithesis. Okay, now then you work it out. If you're like me and my wife, what we usually do is end up going seeing movie C, <laughs> which is second choice for both of us, but it's one we can agree on. That is synthesis, and that's how it works. And, and all Hegel did was simply kind of work out this formula for human interaction. But where the secret society folks took a leg up on it is, is they figured out you don't have to wait for a problem and then offer it a solution and then how it works out is what you get. You create a problem. You create a problem, then you offer the solution and then whatever's worked out, you got it. When the Murrah Federal Building was bombed, they had anti-terrorist legislation pending in Congress. And some of it was pretty draconian. They, it was going to just shred the Constitution. And most people were going, wait a minute, I don't know, I don't know. They weren't going for it. And it was hung up. It wasn't going anywhere. Boom, Federal Building in Oklahoma blows up. I'm not going to go into that, but most of you know there's a whole lot more there than Timothy McVeigh and his little fertilizer bomb, okay? But boom, it goes up. All right, now you got a problem. And what's the solution? Got to pass all this anti-terrorism legislation. So then, but then that's a problem. So what's the solution? Well, you, you work on it, you water it down, and it, it still got passed. Not to the extent they originally wanted, but it got passed. And it's the same thing that we knew the communists did for years. Two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. This stuff they've rammed through over the past year, Homeland Security, Patriot Act. You hide and watch as the years drove on, unless, unless they pump us up again with some other terrorist act, which they're liable to if we start balking at everything. But courts will begin to throw some of that stuff out, and the thing will start coming back into balance. Already there are 60 cities in the United States that have passed ordinances that uh, are ordering their local police and, and law enforcement people not, not to enforce Homeland Security and Patriot Act provisions. 
because they're unconstitutional. Of course, you don't hear much about that through the mass control corporate media, but it's happening, and there will be a backlash. It will come, and things will balance out a little bit, but see, it's already on the books. And, one, and this Homeland Security thing, once you create that whole level of bureaucracy, I guarantee it'll never go away. The CIA is a good example. That was intended to be exactly what it says, the Central Intelligence Agency. It was going to be a small agency that was going to take the intelligence from the Army and the Air Force and the Navy and everybody else and, and coordinate it. And it was, it was intended to stop uh, duplication of effort. And instead, it created a whole monster that we're still having to deal with, okay? And it'll never go away. Homeland Security will never go away. We should never have passed it in the first place, but there was no debate, no talk. They got Homeland Security the night they got, they, it started off, it was a 30-page thesis saying here's what we probably need to do. And by the time it got to Congress, it was 500 pages, and they got it the night before the vote. Now, folks, I don't care how smart you are, you can't read 500 pages, absorb it, and think about it, and make an intelligent decision. And I'll tell you, for that one fact alone, and I'm not even going to argue the merits of Homeland Security, but for the mere fact that your representatives passed a law that they hadn't even read, I think should be cause enough for a recall. You ought to throw every one of them out. Because what's the first thing a lawyer will tell you? Never sign anything until you've read it. And these guys passed the Patriot Act and the Homeland Security, and they didn't even read it. They had no idea what they were passing. Does any of you all remember back about 1997 or 1998, there was a little furor that got going over something called a, a, a banking program called Know Your Customer. Anybody remember that? Yeah, yeah, and the whole idea was is that your bank was going to have to turn around and be a snitch to the federal government. If you were to, if your deposits somehow were a little bit different than the, the normal or if you withdrew an inordinate amount of money or whatever, they were going to report you, be required to report you, and they were going to keep massive personal information files, okay? Your wife, your family, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, but that kind of got public and everybody went, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're not going to put up with that. And sure enough, they kind of backed off and we all thought, we all felt real good, right, that they didn't get that through. It's in Homeland Security. It's in there. It's happening. And you never got to vote on it, did you? You can go all the way back to the war between the states or where I come from, we call it the War of Northern Aggression. <laughs> but it was a deal. It was all a deal. August Belmont, a registered agent of the Rothschild banking family in Europe, came to this country and quickly became the leading seller of bonds for the federal government. He's the one that got the money to prosecute the war between the states. At the same time, he was quietly buying up all the southern bonds. It was a deal. Even Chancellor Bismarck of Germany is on the record as saying that the war in the, in the uh, 1860s in the United States was contrived by the Rothschilds to split the country in half so that they could regain North America for the bankers in France and Britain. And if you'll stop and think about it, where was the bulk of the British Army? It was in Canada. Where was the French Army? Anybody? Mexico, under Maximilian. So they were going to let the north and south bleed each other dry, and then they were going to move in. There's only one man who seemed to understand what was going on, and that was the head Yankee, Abraham Lincoln. I'll have to give him some grudging credit. I think he understood what was happening. And that's why he became the first American president to print his own money, known as greenbacks. Do you know there's only been one other president? in the history of this country that tried to print interest-free money? John F. Kennedy. June 1963, he ordered the issuance of $6 billion in currency, not through the Federal Reserve System, but through the United States Treasury. I have a $5 note. It says Series 1963. It's got red ink on it. It says United States Note. It doesn't say Federal Reserve Note. And I don't think it's a coincidence that both of those presidents were shot in the head.
So now we can see what I call my pyramid of power. That's us down at the bottom. <laughs> the poor, long-suffering public. Over us is the low-level political structure. There's your local city council, school board, and stuff. Most of whom are good people trying to do a difficult job. A few snakes in there, but you know, as we learned in the Army, there's always 2% that won't go along with the program. And your mass media. And this thing maybe that disturbs me most about the mass media having worked in it. It's not that they're bad. It's not that they're liberal. It's not that they're conservative. It's that they're dumb and they're lazy. Okay? They don't want to work. So they will not go out and really pursue a story or look past the superficial explanation. They just take the government handout and they run with it. And this really bothers me because, you know, I think, think about it in our own personal life. Um, if, if you have a good friend and you find that friend is lying to you, then that upsets you. And, but that's a friend, so you try to forgive them and you try to rationalize and think, well, maybe they just didn't understand. Then you, get, then you catch them lying to you again. Well, now it's going, boy, I don't know. Third or fourth time they lie to you, they're no longer your friend, are they? You, I, you just say, I don't want to have anything to do with that person. He's a liar. Well, the government has got caught lie after lie after lie after lie, and still they come out and say something, and the news media just runs with it as if that's the gospel. And then it takes six months, six years, 40 years for us to find out that it was all a big lie. Then you come on up to your military intelligence agencies and your high-level political structure. Then you come on up to the multinational corporations and the, the, the hub of the New World Order, the United Nations, and it's now military arm, NATO. Okay, and then you come on up through the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, and you notice they're not even at the top of the pyramid, because you get up higher, and it even gets higher, and then you get up to the, John Coleman calls the Committee of 300, and others call the Illuminati, and then you got a big question mark, because who's telling those people what to do? Now we start into real history. I'm not going to really belabor you about Freemasonry, other than to tell you that you might want to be aware that the first third party in the United States was the anti-Masonic party. And they broke the back of Masonic Freemason or Freemasonry back in the early 1800s and it never quite recovered until after the Civil War. Within Freemasonry, the, uh, this isn't my theory, this is what Masonic historians and writers will tell you if they're honest. There is a huge outer circle well, first, let me say this. There's a tremendous difference between European Freemasonry and American Freemasonry. The, Nor the European Freemasonry is much more sinister and has much more ties to, uh, to politics and to the Illuminati. But the Ameri North American Freemasonry is much more of a kind of a fraternal order, and they do great things. Their burn centers are wonderful. But within Freemasonry, on, in both sides of the ocean, there's an outer circle and then there's a little inner core circle that knows what's really going on and what their agenda really is. Now don't bother to ask a Masonic friend if that's true because he will tell you no. And that's because he's either part of the outer circle, in which case he really truly does not know that there's an inner circle, or he's part of the inner circle, in which case he's taken a blood oath never to reveal that. Okay. But Freemasonry is where a lot of these thoughts, ideals, and knowledge has been passed along because the men who made up Cecil Rhodes's roundtables, which were the progenitors of the Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral, etc., were Illuminized Freemasons. They were Freemasons who had been instilled with the knowledge and with the agendas of the Illuminati. And what was that? Where did they think they got all this from? Well, here's Manly Wade Hall, uh, a philosopher, a much studied occultist, and, and a very high ranking Mason. And he says, In the Roanoke Pass, the gods walked with men, and they chose from among the sons of God the wisest and the truest. And these they labored with, preparing them to carry on the work of the gods after the spiritual hierarchies themselves had withdrawn into the invisible worlds. With these specially ordained and illumined sons, they left the keys of their great wisdom. These illumined ones founded what we now know as the ancient mysteries. George Washington, big Masonic. 
So they're passing along the ancient mysteries through Freemasonry. By the way, if you think that the Illuminati is just something you can laugh at and just some kind of boogaboo, here's a letter in 1782 from George Washington where he said, it was not my intention to doubt that the doctrines of the Illuminati had not spread to the United States. On the contrary, no one is more fully satisfied of that fact than I am. These guys knew more about what was going on than we do today with all our modern technology and all our electronic communications. Uh, we could, I could spend a whole program talking about Washington, D.C. and the layout of the streets and how it was all built by Masons and that how the, uh, f the uh, floor plan, ground street plan of Washington parallels Virgo, which has always been associated with the Egyptian goddess Isis, okay? So these people, and by the way, if, you, if you're not aware of this, some of you are, some of you aren't. Every time there's a space launch, okay, there is, it's always at a certain time and in a certain manner to conform with astrological numbers, okay? Somebody somewhere still has a great concern about the stars and what's happening. All right, there in, in Washington, D.C., there are 23 major zodiacs in that city, more than any other city in the world. One other thing you're going to love, I don't think it's, no, it's not on this map. In the earliest plat of Washington, D.C., all the lots are numbered except one. You get up to uh, 665, and then it jumps to 667, 668. So what's missing? 666, 666, and guess what sits on that lot today? The capital of the United States. Now it's accepted by historians that the French Revolution was fomented by the Illuminati. And here's a picture of Adam Weishaupt who founded the Bavarian Illuminati and he was only carrying on traditions and knowledge that came from either even much older uh, uh, things. And I think it would be worth quickly to look at the ten steps offered by Karl Marx in his Communist Manifesto. And if you'll compare this to Illuminati writings, you'll find that their goals have always been the same. And, and as I read these, I want you to think about where we are in this country today in relation to this topic. Abolition of private property. Not there yet, but they're working on it. Now we got wet zones and United Nations zones and whatever. A progressive or graduated income tax. Well, we got that. Abolition of all inheritance. They're working on that. Confiscation of property of dissidents and immigrants. Homeland Security's got that taken care of. Creation of a monopolistic central bank. Well, that was done back in 1913. Centralize all communication and transport. Well, see, when Karl Marx offered this, he was thinking in terms of state control. Today, it's corporate control. And instead of the state running the corporations, today, I think, in this country, it's the other way around. Control of all factories and farm production. Again, corporate control. Central ownership of capital with deployable workforce. That's us. Oops, got to, got to move from Silicon Valley. No more jobs. And got to go somewhere else. Blur the distinction between rural country and cities. Boy, that's being done. I moved to the country 22 years ago. It was a wonderful little place. Now I go down there, there's McDonald's, Sonic, Krispy Kreme donut shop. You know, might as well be in Fort Worth or Dallas. Free public education for all children, which on the surface of it sounds like a wonderful idea, and I'm all for it. I think every single kid, no matter where he comes from, no matter what color he is, no matter what, should have a shot at learning the, the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. But folks, that's it. After that, if he has aptitude, he should be able to go on. If he doesn't, he should go to trade schools. This thing, the education has turned into a huge monster. And look what's going on in education today. And look what, and you stop and check what they're being taught. And, and today, they're not even being taught. It, it, what's important is they have to feel good about themselves. 
That's why we, they're trying to do away with grading systems. That's why they're trying to do away with the SATs and all like that. Well, we don't want somebody feeling left behind because they, they can't pass those tests. We want them to feel good about themselves. Well, all I can say is how good about themselves they're going to feel when they're 50 years old and all they can do is sit on the street corner and sell pencils. You know, you got to have that education. And they're not getting it. The, the dumbing down of America is not just a catchword. It is actually happening. So all of these things that were advanced by the Illuminati long before uh, even uh, Karl Marx uh, are all agendas that are still being pushed along on us. And where did they came from? They came from the Knights Templars who built these wonderful cathedrals such as Chartres that has stained glass in it that is so luminous that modern science cannot explain how they do that. Here's some of the stained glass from, uh, the, from charts, and you can also see the, uh, the uh, similarities between the charts at the bottom and uh, the uh, Al-Qaeda mosque in Jerusalem's Temple Mount. They brought back knowledge from the Middle East. Again, look at the striking similarities between these Egyptian uh, artifacts and artifacts in, in Jerusalem. Uh, you've got a black Madonna that you still find in southern France compared to uh, Isis. Uh, over here you've got the winged uh, person from uh, Egypt and another one that was found in a 9th century BC Jewish palace. It's all the same information, folks. It's all the same. We've been taught that here's all these different empires and civilizations. It's all a continuation. Uh, this is a great one. At the top, of course, you can see the famous Egyptian winged disc that Sitchin and others says probably represents the planet Nibiru. <laughs> and in the bottom is a crop circle. Probably a hoax one, but it uh, shows that somebody's still thinking in terms of the winged disc. Now this brings us to the mystery of Rennes Le Chateau. And for those of you that have read Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and Messianic Legacy and all like that, they go into this in great detail, but they never really, really quite just tell you what it really is, other than the fact that there apparently is some fabulous treasure buried over in the, in the caverns and cave systems that honeycomb the foothills of the Pyrenees there in southern France. And I was there two years ago, and it is an amazing place. It really is, and the stories are all there. Poussin, the artist apparently was on to some of these secrets because in this painting up here circle in red he seems to be giving us a fleeting glimpse of what the ark of the covenant so there's some there's all of this knowledge that's being passed along here here is the again the the masonic and zodiacal uh, street plans of Washington compared to the same, you see the same geometric designs being used to build Rensselaer Chateau Again, we see the same knowledge being passed down. Here's what you probably don't realize. Rensselaer Chateau is on the far left corner over here, and if you connect these holy sites, you have a geometric pentagram that encompasses a 40-mile circumference area. Any of you that have read Maurice Shaitlin's book know about the Maltese cross that is in the Aegean Sea that you can only connect by getting a map and connecting these sacred sites. Again, ancient knowledge passed along. Some of it, it lost, some of it gets distorted, but it's all coming down through the secret societies. And where did it all start? It started in southern Iraq also known as Mesopotamia. In the Bible, it's referred to as the Chaldees or Chaldea. Now, one of the tragic things of the, of the uh, turmoil that's going on in the Middle East is the fact that what you actually have are cousins, family people fighting each other because the Arabs trace their lineage back to the biblical patriarch Abraham. And the Jews trace their heritage back to the biblical patriarch Abraham. So they're all related but they can't get along. If we could go back to that, uh, to the map. The Bible tells us that Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees. So he was not a Jew. He was not even a Semite. He was a Sumerian. 
and he had knowledge from the ancient Sumerian culture. And he brought that knowledge where? To Egypt. This is where the, the great Egyptian civilization got started with the knowledge that was brought out of Mesopotamia. Now we get to the question, and now the rest of it, more knowledge was brought by Moses. Except who was Moses? There is a very cogent argument to be made that, that Moses, is, Moses is not a name, it's a title. Moses, meaning the pretender to the throne, the one true heir. And now we go and we look at the story of Moses. Oh, he was hidden away as a baby. He was placed in a basket of bulrushes, floated down the river to uh, relatives, raised by foster parents, educated as an Egyptian, believed in the one true God. Now, you know what? If you go back and study about Akhenaten or Amenhotep IV, you find that it's the same story. <laughs> Hidden away as a baby, placed in a basket of bull rushes, floated down the river, raised by foster family. The foster family were Hebrew slaves. Well, you all know, any of you all who have adopted or are adopted or are, are adopting children, your real parents are who raise you, not who gives birth to you. Okay, we all know this. So Amenhotep is raised by Hebrews who instill in him the idea of the one true God. And when he assumes the throne as Pharaoh, he changes his name to Akhenaten, meaning the one who worships, worships Atim, the one true God. And in the, even in the Bible, it says he was an Egyptian of, you know, or had great knowledge of Egypt, was very powerful in Egypt. How's a Hebrew slave get that? So now that whole story takes on a whole different coloration. And when he leads, when he is th overthrown because he's shaken up the, the, the religious hierarchy of the day, which was making tons of money because everybody had to pay homage to all the various gods, they didn't like that. So they overthrew Akhenaten and they banished him. And when he left, he took his family with him the Israelites or the Hebrews and he was they considered him still the one true king or Moses but whether or not that's true we find again that all of the information flows from um, Iraq or Samaria into Egypt and of course we know that from Egypt then all this knowledge was centered in the ancient mystery schools of Egypt which then went on to the ancient mystery schools of Greece and then on into the Romans and this was our Western heritage. Now all of this was accumulated regardless of who Moses was whether he was a, a title or a name when the Israelites were sent out of Egypt and freed they were told to take what you need. Well, some of them, I'm sure that meant take some clothing, take some food, but some of them meant take everything that wasn't nailed down. And they took gold, silver, they took scrolls, they took all kinds of things on their travels in the wilderness. And we know that during their travels in the wilderness, they attacked and conquered a variety of people in city-states. And as was the habit in that time, oops, are we out of time? Oh, thank God, I saw something here. Okay, good, we're on track. I gotta wrap this up though, because I know you're gonna have some questions. So I'll make it quick. So they got this vast treasure hoard, gold, silver, but they've also got knowledge passed down from uh, Samaria. And I'm sure they got tired of lugging all this through the desert. So at one point, Solomon built a huge temple. And part of it, of course, was to worship. Part of it was to house the Ark of the Covenant, their communication device for God, and to house and warehouse all of this fabulous treasure. So what happened to it? Interestingly enough, when the Romans took Palestine, they didn't just move in and conquer it. They, uh, they worked a deal. They said, look, if you'll let us, uh, you can keep your king and you can keep your lifestyle if you'll just pay homage to Rome. And they said, okay, and King Herod was installed, built his palace over the old, at the same place as the old Solomon Temple, there on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which is now, of course, a Muslim mosque, the Dome of the Rock. Um, but then 
the Jews began to chafe under the Roman leadership, and uh, in 66 AD there was a revolt. I'm sure it didn't just start overnight, it didn't end overnight. The Romans then sent troops in, and they conquered the whole thing. Well, when they came in, they sacked Jerusalem, and they sacked the temple. Uh, King Herod's palace at that time, formerly the, the Temple of Solomon. But they didn't get everything, because the Jews knew what was happening, and they took everything they could, and they buried it under the temple in a series of cave systems and stuff, and they carefully hid it away from the Romans. But the Romans, nevertheless, got a good portion of it, maybe even half or something, but they got a good portion. And what did they do with it? Well, they took it as booty back to Rome. 400 years later, Alaric the Goth sacks Rome. And again, as the way it happens, they took everything out of there. They took what the treasure, half the treasure of Solomon, and they took it back to their home stomping grounds, which was where? The Landioc region of southern France. And they hid it in the cave systems down there. And this was both the wealth, treasure, and particularly the information and knowledge that was passed along to a group of people that became known as the Cathars. And the Cathars then were a thorn in the side of the Roman church because they had straight information. They had information that went contrary to what the Roman church was trying to put out, and that's why they never went along with their program. This, of course, gave rise to the Albigensian Crusade, where the Pope sent a papal army through the Landioc region and murdered everybody that was suspected of being a Cathar. That's where the expression got started, by the way, when they besieged the town of Brazier's. Uh, they sent a message back to the Pope and said, how are we going to know the Cathars from everybody else? And the Pope is supposedly told him, he said, well, kill them all and let God sort them out. And we've heard that same quote. I heard that during Vietnam. You know, how do we tell the V.C. from the Vietnamese? Kill them all, let God sort them out. So this, uh, but they didn't, obviously they didn't kill all the Cathars. Some of the wealthy families there in southern France were Cathars. And they knew, because they had access to this knowledge, that the rest of the treasure of Solomon is buried over beneath Herod's palace in Jerusalem. So they fomented the Crusades, ostensibly to retake the Holy Land. But in reality, these French families, the uh, Blanchards and, the, uh, uh, and uh, St. Bernard and these folks, they knew this treasure was over there and they wanted it. And so sure enough, in 1099, they conquered Jerusalem. And who shows up but nine knights from southern France, all connected to these Cathari families. And they say, we want to form a new military order called the Knights of the Temple. And so King Baldwin says, okay. And so he, he uh, allows them to form the Knights Templar. And they were supposed to be guarding the roads there, but they never did. What they did was excavate under the... Uh, temple and regained the rest of the treasure of Solomon. Again, not only a treasure of gold, silver, and precious stones, but a treasure of knowledge. And they hauled it from Jerusalem back through Rome and back into the Landioc region. And now at this point, the treasure of Solomon is reunited and hidden away in southern France in the area of rennes la chateau That's what the mystery is all about. That's the treasure. Now whether Father Saunier ever actually found the treasure is open to question. I suspect not. But he knew that that's what it was all about. He knew that this was in the right area and that's why he was suddenly wealthy and all the strange things went on with rennes la chateau And the, this was just a picture of the knights uh, that they showing their Maltese cross. And of course, then the Pope goes after the Knights Templars because he knows that they have dangerous information plus wealth. What happened to the reunited wealth near Rensselaer Chateau? In March of 1944, Otto Scorzini, the guy in the cap with the binoculars, leads a battalion of SS troops to southern France. Working off of the notes and, and publications of a German named Otto Rahn, who had been to Rennes-la-Chateau several times in the 20s and 30s and had 
working closely with Heinrich Himmler and his SS group that was heavy involved in the occult, they felt like they knew where the treasure was. And on March the 16th, 1944, uh, they send uh, the Germans into the, they couldn't do it before then because Southern France was part of Vichy France uh, and, uh, and technically was supposed to be free France and they didn't want to cause any more tr trouble. But in September of 43, uh, Rome fell and Mussolini was deposed and at the same time that the Germans rescued Mussolini off the mountaintop, they also uh, poured into southern France and took over the whole country. So now they're able to freely operate in France and they sent troops down there in March of 44. He sends a one-word one word telegram back to Berlin on March the 16th that says, Eureka, I found it. The greatest, most fabulous treasure in the history of the world, both of riches and of knowledge, is now in the hands of the Nazis. They took it back to Berchtesgaden, which you can see the diagram here has an underground labyrinth of hidden systems and caves and bunkers and everything else. But it probably did not remain there. It was taken out of Germany on something called Auktionadlerflut or Operation Eagle Flight. This was instigated in August of 1944 by the head of the German Central Bank and the head of the IG Farben Combine and Martin Bormann, who by that time was running the show. Hitler was pretty much over the edge with megalomania plus all the drugs that he was being fed. These guys took the combined wealth of Europe that they had looted, plus Solomon's treasure, and they created 750 corporations all around the world. Their connecting banks were the Bank of International Settlements, the Deutsche Bank, which today is still a powerhouse in the financial world, Chase Bank, which later became Chase Manhattan, and I particularly want you to notice Union Banking Corporation. Because in 1942, one of the chief stockholders of the Union Banking Corporation was prosecuted in this country by the Justice Department under the Trading with the Enemies Act, and they accused him of being nothing but a financial front man for Hitler and the Nazis. And that man was Prescott Bush, and also his father-in-law, George Herbert Walker. So when you hear people say that these people running the country today are a bunch of neo-Nazis, I want you to stand up and say that is not so. There's nothing neo about them. They're the real old Nazis. <laughs> and the attorneys for the Schroeder Bank, which was one of the chief connecting banking operations, was a law firm in New York. Uh, Sullivan and Cromwell and their leading attorneys who worked with the Nazis was John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles. John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State under Eisenhower, the guy that brought us the Vietnam War, and Alan Dulles, of course, who was one of the longest running CIA directors who then sat on the Warren Commission to determine what happened to John Kennedy. If you bloggers self-organize and attach yourself like leeches to specific issues, corporations, organizations, challenges, whatever. You will be the intelligence Minutemen of this century. The power is in your hands. There aren't enough guns to kill us all, and Halliburton can't build the jails fast enough to keep us down. Bloggers, as Linux is organized, where you grab onto an issue or something, and you are part of a structured citizen journalism blogging thing that lets no evil doing go unnoticed, that rules. So I think we're at a turning point. I think we're at the very beginning of a historic tidal shift in power restoring the Constitution. I don't know how many of you are following this, but the Comptroller General has told Congress the United States of America is insolvent. We're out of Schlitz. We literally have no money to make it to the next decade. Now, there's some very easy solutions. I could eliminate all income taxes tomorrow and have more than enough money to fund the government by using some other guy's bright idea. We tax the Federal Reserve at point triple zero six, doubles our money until we decide to put them out of business permanently, because we certainly should not have central banks. We've put together an electoral reform pledge, and it's my view that any member of Congress, any member of the Senate that refuses to sign both the constitutional pledge, supporting the Constitution, and the electoral reform pledge should be put out of business.
and I believe that will be 95% of all of these people. It may be time to literally dump Congress on its ass and start over. The government has gotten stupid to the point that it can't write a statement of work. And so they ask the contractors to write a statement of work, and the contractors write a statement of work saying, you need more of what I haven't been able to sell. And the government says, oh, yeah, right, good. Put it in the budget. This is real shit. I can crack all 10 of the top-level threats to humanity in less than 25 years for less than one-third of what the world is spending on the military. Blog that. And I will tell you the price of buying back the United States government. It's $500 million a year. In the early 90s, Newt Gingrich and the Republicans got together. Their plan is now on the street. It's been exposed by a Columbia professor. They concluded that they could buy the United States government from school board to state house to White House for $300 million a year, and by golly, they did. And every single member of Congress is impeachable for having abdicated their Article I responsibilities under the Constitution and serving as foot soldiers. And try to wake people up and impart this knowledge to them and find out that they just have walls built in front of them. They want to be slaves. But we're making some chinks in those walls. You too can have a free press, and that's what it's going to take to get this country back without bloodshed. And I'm going to tell you right now, unless we can be successful in creating a real free press, where the American people get different viewpoints other than those expressed in the establishment controlled media, there's going to be a civil war in this country and it's going to come soon. The only thing that can stop it is by waking up vast amounts of sleeping people. Sheeple is what they are. They are following the Judas goat right into the shearing pens and from there they will go to the slaughter and they will not know that anything is wrong until they smell the blood of the sheeple in front of them. That's why in a White House memorandum I was named as the most dangerous radio host in America not because I'm going to go out and shoot somebody but because I shoot documented facts which cannot be refuted. That's why. That's what's dangerous Seek ye the truth, and the truth will make you free, and nothing else will do it. Jesus Christ has never lied to anybody. Why won't you listen to him? Don't spread a rumor. Spread the truth. Document it. Prove it. Make it irrefutable, and you too will become dangerous to those who admire us in lies and enslave us. Do you think that we'll ever see a day Hmm. when there's enough people in this country that understand that simple, basic, essential concept in money that things will change? Well, I do. do yeah. As some of our callers tonight demonstrated that, while others, um, you know, particularly the one that wanted to know where's the money going to come from, mm -hmm. still don't get it. Uh, you know, Where's it going to come from? Well, it's going to come from a group of private banks that are going to essentially make a huge profit for the privilege. That is the key to our problems, folks. And until we all get that, uh, we're not going to make any change. And that's really what I hope we do. And I read today that the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, mm. may have to resort to printing money right. as a special drawing rights. SDRs, yeah. SDRs. Now, oh, it's the same people that own the IMF. Yeah, I, IMF right. is established. Right? <laughs> same people. Yeah, same people. Yeah. And IMF and Bank of International Settlements, although they sometimes they operate at odds. But the IMF has, was given the ability to have special drawing rights from our treasury. So when they write a special drawing right, they write, uh, you know, pay to the IMF one special drawing right. That allows them to go into our gold reserves really? and buy gold for $42.20 an ounce. No, wait a minute. No, no, explain that a minute. <laughs> Who are these people and what can they do? <laughs> what can they do? The International Monetary Fund has a right to draw on our treasury at the rate of $42.20 an ounce, the official price of gold. You remember what do you I, mean draw on our treasury? Well, that's what the special drawing right allows them to do. So instead of saying we're going to give them a billion dollars, it's much cheaper if you just say, oh well, at forty-two twenty, you know, they're only taking uh, forty million. But in reality, what they've really gotten is gold that's worth nine hundred and change. But 
in their world, a special drawing right and a dollar are pegged at forty-two twenty-two. And who owns the IMF? Well, it's a member banks that own the Federal Reserve. They just own it on a bigger scale. This is a, You're a worldwide me. organization. Yes. I cannot believe we the people. How did we? How did it ever get this this screwed up? Well, we weren't paying attention. We took our eyes off the ball in the, um, you know, basically with World War One and World War Two, mm. uh, we allowed the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and its owners to consolidate their control over the world's financial system. And then over the last 90 years, they've just reinforced that with cement. So now trying to get out of it is going to be ridiculous. Oh, man. That's a very spooky story that you just laid out there, the special drawing rights. Yes. I'd never heard about that Most before. people have not heard of them, and uh, they, that's how the IMF draws its uh, funds from its members, mm -hmm. by special drawing rights. And so the J.P. Morgans of the world, the city groups, the Goldman Sachs, the uh, uh, Shanghai Bank of China, uh, it's the same people that, that, that are in there in this IMF? Indeed. If you look at the history of World War I and II, uh, especially World War II, under the trading with the enemy circumstances, the Bank of International Settlements and, and the IMF, actually more to uh, the Bank of International Settlements, mm. IMF was not yet in existence. Mm. Uh, the BIS actually sat around the table during World War II with representatives from the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve Bank, and the Bundesbank and the Bank of Italy. So, you know, while on the battlefield, they're killing each other by the thousands inside the boardroom. It's all business as usual. It's, and, uh, it, you know, the, no all, crisis in the boardroom. Always about the money. Isn't yes, it, it is. Yeah. Just follow the old That's money. All you have to do. They came on TV every day and told us, a depression is coming, a depression is coming, and people stopped spending money. We bought it. We said, okay, give the banks our money, give the private companies our money, anything to stay out of depression. And they saved Goldman Sachs, they saved GM, they saved Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Those companies are going to be making money hand over fist pretty soon. And the American taxpayer is going to be paying off that debt for the rest of our freaking lives, for a hundred years or freaking more. And they want to say, they have the audacity to come on TV and say they saved us? It, this is AIG, AIG, Goldman, Goldman, and you know, what the Bavarian Illuminati, the Trilateral Commission, Goldman Sachs, and the Queen of England are not all bad. Wow. Which side are you? Are we gonna squeeze a couple of things? Sure. In? All right. First of all, uh, let's do this one. In, in my opinion, the young generation of whites, blacks, brown, whatever else there is, you're living at a time of extremism, a time of revolution, a time when there's got to be a change. People in power have misused it, and now there has to be a change, and a better world has to be built and the only way it's going to be built with with it with, is with extreme methods and i for one will join in with anyone don't care what color you are as long as you want to change this miserable condition that exists on this earth thank you because it's all about that money monies google marvin bush top security of securicom of the world trade centers research neil bush he the one that made the bill to try to sell a Porsche to Dubai. We already know who Jeb Bush. <laughs> we already know who he is. <laughs> His father gave Osama bin Laden, um, what, $3 billion to fight the Soviets? Then that grandfather, Prescott Bush, funded Hitler, Hitler's banker. Decent bank. First Union Bank, New York City. Yeah, locked up for trading with the um, enemy and treason. Then release because they base and Illuminati's all together, man. Shit is funny, yo. We've been really been fucked, yo, and they getting rich and they getting rich. BPO is not even from this country, yo. British Petroleum. And they telling you you can't stand on your land that your that your founding fathers fought that our ancestors fought for? Huh? They lock us up, give you a grade a, a class D federal what? What the fuck is that? A federal charge, a class D, I never heard of that. You give a shit when the kingpins ain't even getting out, the pawn in them ain't get that shit. But you ready to give it to some people that's taking pictures? Wow. That's where they getting at, people. Yeah, they really blatant now. Because the internet fucking up all their monies. Fucking up their monies. This is what we leaving our children, people. $37 trillion the cost of the bailout this year. How many people know that? That's my wedding money. Okay, I spend the money. Ain't no Shit is just like, wow, yo. 
What's wrong with being wow, people losing their jobs. 150,000 Americans lost their jobs in June. We only in the third day. Independence Day is tomorrow. I'm going hard for all the Americans, the independence. No, yeah, man. fuck that shit, man. Me and Ann got to up this country, yo. So think of a new one. The Rothschilds, they print out money. Federal Reserve, private. They just been, yo, they just been raping everybody. And it didn't even matter if you was white or black. During them times, but that's what they portrayed out there. So they can have us divide and conquer and stay away from that nigger and stay away from that cracker. All that ignorant shit, yo, why they stealing everything, yo? They was rich elite families, yo, and they still running shit to this day since the beginning of the time, since the oil shit. We could have had free energy since 1920, Nikola Tesla. Why fire all that? JP Morgan and the Rockefellers and the Ford families, and they said, oh, no. Nah. When he demonstrated that with the Warcliffe Tower, and they seen that, and they said, well, where can we put the meter? J.P. Morgan words, oh, my peasants will have nothing free. Whoa, who was the peasants? I guess if he wasn't a, you know, billion trillionaire, I guess he was talking to you. Us.